so my talk today, I will inspire some talks that I have seen in this year from ATT, from Google, from NVIDIA. And I think that my talk will be a little bit motivational for you to know more about AI, mainly deep learning. Also, I will show some code and some math because as a professor, I love to show math and code. Amanda know that. And this first step on my talk about uh, inspiring in an ATT presentation called the road to 2025. Yes, we have a routine with new technologies like morning routine using augmented reality. And the first time you get morning workout to incomplete personal trainers with wearables using measures about health metrics. Also, you can see uh, your news at morning using your wearable glasses with augmented reality or virtual reality. And go to the work using your autonomous car or your autonomous driving. At the nightlife, you can meet your friends for a game after work using your augmented reality to find your car, to find your lift find your friends at the station or at the game. Also, you can see replays of the game using your cell phone, looking for the video, the replay. So you have a, a rare, very rich content. Box applications and development over here in this road to 2025. Also, using your smartphone, you can connect with your friends using also augmented reality, video streaming, watch concert and play music around the road. At the point of view in industry, we're calling uh, about more advanced technologies with low latency 5G, with telemedicine, with widespread remote surgery become very common, AR, can help the bridge between knowledge and skills between the workforce and the managers. And also we can see about transforming the shopping experience with a lot of information over here. And then we have the 10 technology disruptors and we can see something common of them. We have the 5G at the first, a very special term edge cloud the AI and machine learning evolving in a distributed way. Open source that's the core of the machine learning today because we're talking about new algorithms, new models and new databases that must be open source to, for the great adoption of the technologies. And also other technologies like the Internet of Everything, robotics, personal assistance, virtualization, virtual augmented reality, autonomous drones and cars. And at the core, we have AI. AI and open source, I can talk, they work together and our game changes also in the scenario of 5G. Uh, when I talk about 5G here, it's about connection, integration with the cloud. Then we have 5G and the edge, that the connection between the servers in the cloud and the, another point in the Internet of Things. And we have some points like real-time network, because uh, how today you think about real-time, autonomous driving is about real-time. A million of devices working together. Intense computer, the edge. Edge in this place, we can talk about Internet of Things integrated with the cloud. And diverse demand applications, as I, I showed before, mainly using virtual reality, AR, that we have a video and big data traveling at the Internet at high speeds. And AI and machine learning together unlocks the um, learning for a complex pattern adaptive control, autonomous operation, and then courses extracurricular revenue. An open source enables collaborative communities, press standard specifications and code, accelerated progresses, and common tools in interoperability. Now, let's step by step. 
we see the future, the future is beautiful. And now Blair talks about AI. First, what is required for AI? I select this a common set of knowledge that it's good to know to you get a more intensive development use AI algorithms. We can talk about calculus, about numeric computation, complex analysis, statistics, probability, information theory, algebra families, discrete mathematics, operational research, and also about geometry and basic algebra. Our very deep knowledge over here, computer science knowledge, engineer knowledge, math knowledge, it's necessary to know everything about it to work with the AI. It's good to know. Today, we have a lot of frameworks that you can use these algorithms, you can use this data, and you don't need to know everything about it to use AI. But it's good to know to get a more deep development, a more innovation development of you propose to work with AI. So this minimum set is good if you need to work more or you think about the programming AI and AI solutions. This is a guide for you. AI, we have a lot of, uh, it's a very big field indeed. We have AI like uh, rule-based reasoning, it's a cloud of information. We have machine learning, it's a subset of AI, like decision trees, logistic regression. Inside machine learning, we have a small set of shell encoder. And the core, or a very small set in his presentation learning, we have this famous work of deep learning. That is the moment of the AI. The learning is in everywhere. And how this work? The main part that they get a lot of attention is deep learning. The classical machine learning has this overflow. We define the problem, collect the data that we stood in the problem, extract the features of the problem, then train the model and evaluate. Deep learning, that is the more interesting approach, we have a different overflow. When we define the problem, collect the data, and the neural network learns the features about your data automatically in this kind of magic uh, i can say it's very beautiful because we are still uh, learning about deep learning it's work it works but uh, we don't know why it works yet and train the model evaluate so deep learning is this thing it's very interesting you have about a lot of breakthroughs involving deep learning. I get this timeline that I get in the NVIDIA presentation that shows for us. We can say, point, uh, we have the Atari game is solving by reinforcement learning. And then we have the ImageNet. ImageNet was a breakthrough very interesting because we have image recognition in the same net level of the human can recognition something. So you get uh, some person that is very trained in recognition some images. The ImageNet AI can equiparate or can achieve the same result that a certain uh, human being can achieve. Also have the AlphaGo results that uh, we have uh, AI winning from a human being. The conventional speech recognition, uh, lip reading, and so on. Since 2012, deep learning achieved very interesting breakthroughs. And these breakthroughs are so strong that change the way we think about AI. For example, before 2012, we have about uh, image net accuracy, about uh, a low level of accuracy. And nowadays, we can say with a very good base and very good data, you can have about um, 100 accuracy. 
with not loss of accuracy here. And this is happening in all fields that you can apply AI with deep learning. Speech recognition, image recognition, and so on. And then we are living in a very interesting in a evolutionary times due to AI improving in amazing rates. So let's see some code examples. For these code examples, I use some TensorFlow examples of talking about Google. And these frameworks are very interesting to work with it. So let's step back and talk about linear regression. Linear regression is a meta application for you to get some data and learn about it. Create a function on a data describing the, this data. So in linear regression, you can use TensorFlow Keras models using the function sequential and then create a layer, one layer indeed. This one layer is not a neural network, but it's a small function. When the first parent is one step and no activation function. So this is mm, linear algebra, a function that achieves all your, uh, my data with one linear result. And then using Keras modules, I can improve it. For example, using the, in this time, uh, activation function, the sigmoid. Sigmoid is a function described over this data set and this graph here. And then we can use my data and reduce I have maybe apply a reduction over it. And my data now is over zero and one, creating a small set. And this, I can use a logistic regression to describe better my data. Also, I can apply another model like softmax regression. And now I use more layers. And this, I can describe better my data. So I can use 10 values. Each one is about zero and one. So I have a softmax look uh, activation. And in this time, I can use now a probabilistic description of my data. At the linear, I get a line that describes my data. And now with this, I get 10 values using the softmax activation, and then my data can be described like a dense probabilistic one. And then one step ahead, I can construct a neural network. Uh, we can see that using the Keras model, we just apply another layer. In this, now, this new layer, I apply another activation. Now I have indeed in my hand a neural network, a small one indeed. And then this second layer, I, I put a value like a, a small one that is can be described by my data. I have a, a 1,000 or a million of points in my data. And then I reduce to this one and use the activation relu, a non-linear activation function, use it to a very common one. I, I will don't enter in this field indeed, I just, I just use it for illustrating the use of pairs. And then apply my previous one, softmax activation. Then using this layer with, with relu, I create the first step of a neural networks that reduces my 1,000, 1 million data to this, this small one set worth 128. And over it, I apply my softmax that reduces to 10 values. In this 10 values, I have a distribution. My intention over here is that from my 1,000 or 1 million, my big data, I have this reduction that this 10 values of the distribution describes my data 
with uh, a very good description, I can say. So this is an overview, very simple, very basic, how a network works. It's about functions, it's about approximation. So I have this big data, I don't tell what is it. I just tell this is about one million points, it can be numbers, can be image, can be whatever, pixels, representation of sounds, and then apply this sequential model. The first layer, I apply a reduction using ReLU, reduce to 128, and then the next layer, reduced to 10 values. And now I, I believe that the 10 values, which one is a uh, one between zero and one, describe my data. The, ne the next step, I can create a deep neural network. And then I apply new layers over it, changing the activation function. In this case, it's recommended to use Hello. And then when I achieve more layers, I achieve the deep neural network, the popular one, deep learning. And the interesting effect over here that when I have the previous example, where I have the big data, and then I apply one layer and then the output with softmax, I can describe my data at the end of the softmax. But in the real world, I need to do a feature extraction of the data or get a better description with this, for example, 10 values. With deeper net neural networks, at the moment that I put more layers, I don't need to do this feature extraction. The layers itself do this to me. And with more and more layers, more describe, more feature expression happen in my data. Well, with it's this basic concept, we can now talk about the families of neural networks or the applications. When we call families, we call about our data, because I, <clears throat> I can say we have a lot of type of data from images to time series to speech and so on. And for each type of data, we have each type of strategies applying from uh, neural networks. So the first one, the deep neural networks, as the example that I showed before, we have uh, our data organizing input, like a vector of numbers. And then the network is constructed about dense layers. So dense layers, it's like we have a lot of lines, like before, with ReLU or other activation functions, also with different type uh, sizes. And then we have the as output and pre prediction. But that prediction must to be compared with what we call about ground truth or what we're expecting about prediction. So we're looking for, for example, a regression, apply the regression to predict the price of a house based in square feet and the number of bedrooms and so on. Also by far, we can have a different type of data and we expect uh, some value. There's expectation we call ground truth. And then using uh, feed forward neural networks, the basic one, I compare the input vector, for example, the data about the size of the house, the location, everything that I transform in a vector of numbers, apply the neural network then with dense layers, and then we get that probability result and compare it to the ground truth. With this comparison, then we can do the prediction over the data. Other type, very popular indeed, about with neural network, is the convolutional neural networks. 
In this type of data, we have the application of the image classification. The input of these convolutional, convolutional neural networks is an image. And inside of a data, we have the network with convolutional and pulley layers. In this type of layers, we have a lot of layers doing loops, feedbacks. And these layers also are prepared to work with images. We have modules and parameters and other things that com composes this network. And at the output, we have the prediction. This prediction, for example, classifies the image. So I can train a model of thousands of pictures of cats and dogs. And in, at the input, I can put an image of a cat or a dog. And the output says which type of data or which type of semantic data we have in this image. The C and Ns are the most, I can say not important, but on the more popular one, because we can see the results very fast. And this is where, where the AI is more used today. At the inside of a company or of the industry, in the industry 4.0, we have a lot of applications of CNNs, like smart cameras, quality control, and so on. So we have a lot of good output in the, the prediction using CNNs today. It's about uh, approximately 100 of success in the identification of the input image. Due to that, we have a lot of applications of CNNs in a lot of fields in industry. An example of code in CNN, in this type we have a use old other function on 2D. In this type we have a small one indeed, two lines that do the work of destruct the features. Remember that in deep neural networks, the features are inside the neural network with the two lines, for example. We do the extraction of the features, so we have an image input, like a photography of a cat or a dog. And then we extract the features. And then the next step with the dense network, we do the classification of the data. And the input of the data is a previous one that we have, we can call the training model. And the classification occurs over here. Another type of uh, neural networks is the recurrent neural networks that they use to classify time series or sequence of data. Data. So my input is different here. We have a sequence. The sequence can be a text, can be a speech, can be a video, and then the recurrent layers are trained to analyze the sequence and output the prediction. For example, sentiment analysis. We train a model with thousands of positive and negative sentences. And then we, we use a test as I put the sequence. And then the RNN classifies the sequence. Other types of applications, like time series for questions, apply uh, a lot of applications in financial um, prediction that use time series as input sequencing. A very interesting example is the Google Translate. We have the input sequence of uh, a test in Portuguese, and then the RNN applied in Google Translate translated to English or French or so on. And then we have a, a very interesting application of neural networks that called encoders. This one is very amazing indeed. It's very new. We have a lot of interesting results in it. And that's called encoder decoder. We apply one of the previous neural network like the DN, CNN, or RNN, use has an input 
an image, a test, a sequence, or so on, you have a universe that has inputs. A decoder network is a step where we apply our neural network, the chosen one that you choose, and reduce your input data, data in a representation of the data, number or a vector of numbers, not commonly a float number, a real number. And then that representation is uh, applied in a decoder network. It's like we, uh, we get a neural network, we do the inverse of it, we do the opposite. We put, we get this neural network, put a vector inside of it, and take at the output a probably input of it. It's a very interesting uh, type of thing about neural networks. Because neural networks are mainly a math function. So I can put as input an image. The neural network trans, uh, transforms this image in representation, like a number of uh, number or a vector of numbers. And the decoder do the inverse one. Take that number and creates an image. And then I can choose one network for encoder. In order for the code, I can create very interesting things. <clears throat> for example, a very interesting example. I can create an encoder that do a convolution neural network over an image. So I get this image of this guy surfing and then create this representation in vectors, a flattened one that we call. And then get this representation and put inside of an air and an uh, equivalent neural network that translates that uh, vector representation to a sentence create, for example, a uh, spectrum like a wave and a man in a wave, a surf. And then my decoder translates that vector for a test. And then I can create, for example, a translator that reads an image and creates a legend or a sentence about this image. And then we can see the power of the encoders because we can trans forms an image to a sentence and apply back, create a description of the image. And so on, we have a universe over it. We can use this to translate a test to an image also. We can do the opposite. We can have a test describing uh, a scenario or environment, apply the RNN, creates the flat uh, representation, and then use the CNN we create the image that is described by this vector. So encoders are very interesting thinking about creating data. Because now we can say that AI just no, uh, just on, not only classifies data, also can use to create data. And then we have a very interesting application of encoders called GAN. Uh, generative adversarial networks. In this application, we have a, a very profound in deep knowledge about uh, probabilistic statistics. As I said before, it's very interesting to know about math behind the neural network, indeed, because it's very beautiful concept that we, we are seeing today. But also you can use some framework to apply without know, but it's very interesting to know about how everything works. And generative adversarial networks is something that we can look with a very good eyes and did very interesting eyes because the guns receive as input a random seed. We're not talking about image or sequence or speech just a random number, and then we use it to feed a network called generation, generator. The generator can be, for example, uh, convolution neural networks that get that input seed and do proposition of an image. In this, in this 
type of uh, description of the adversarial net, adversary networks we call a fake image. The random seed generates a, a set of pixels. And the set of pixels we can put in a bitmap and call it image. And then we have a second network called discriminator, also called as detective critics, that has has input a real image, a real one. And then this discriminator compares this fake image with a real image. And then in this comparison, as we can say the real image is the ground truth, the fake image is the prediction. The output uh, is called real or fake. And then some magic happens over here. We can put these two networks to work together in adversarial way, do this name in generative adversarial networks. The generator creates uh, a lot of fake images, thousands, millions of fake images. And I, we can adjust the random seed or the parameters of the network. And can we can create not a fake image totally random. We can create a fake image of a face, of an environment, a fake image of a, a dog, a person, so on. We can adjust this fake image. And this discriminator compare with another data set that we want to work with, for example, person, a dog, or so on. Do you choose the your image that you, you want to work? And then we have some magic happening at the output. We will achieve a result that we have a fake image that is very similar to a real one, but is not a real one, considering, of course, your database of real images. So we have a, a point where these two networks convolute together. And then we have a fake image that looks like a real image, but is not a real image. It's not present in your data set. And this fake image is generated by the generator that generated a lot of images. And then the discriminator selects one that says, OK, this is, oh, this is fake, but it's very similar the real image. So the output at network, you have a point that a little bit real one. So you have an image that looks like real, but is not. And then we have a very interesting result with GANS. We create content. So with GANS, the neural network can create data using the random seed and the reference data model, in which we call the real data model and then a new one is created. And this, uh, I call this, this the top of the neural, network, neural networks nowadays because neural networks not used to classify, but to create. You, you can see about a lot of results using GANs. The deep fakes are very popular. The art using GANs, we have a lot of results over here about using GANs for create art indeed. Very interesting to see. So now we get about the insides of a neural network. Just a little bit of math again. So a neural network or a neuron of a neural network is just a function, a linear combination of inputs and weights. It's about multiplication and sums. The inputs can be vectors, can be numbers, can be pixels, but all is binary. I'm talking about computers. Computers are binary. So the inputs are numbers. The weights also are numbers. The weights are the approximation of the function that describe a neural network. We sum, the, we get the inputs multiplied by weights and sum everything. We can use the activation function that do some work with this result of the sum. For example, the ReLU, the Softmax, each activation giving to us a result. The ReLU gets your number at the end of the sum, 
converges to a step function like zero or the number that you're looking for. Others convert to a range of from zero to one and so on. We have the a universe of equation functions. And the output of this linear combination can be a number or a vector. So the neuron of the neural network is this simple math. I love to talk about simple math. The magic behind neural networks, it just sums multiplications. And then the fully connected network, the fully connected layer, we have a lot of neurons. Each neuron calculates a dot product. This dot product use a matrix and then we interpolate everyone. So the input of a function becomes the output of your order. The output of one becomes the input of others. So you get uh, this very big set of sums, dot products, and so on. So look, we have, we're talking about simple math. We're talking about logarithm exponentials or integrals, no just multiplication, just sum. Then back into Keras, we can do this with MAT, like a MATLAB or C programming, but if you're talking about frameworks, we can use this function. For example, create a instantiation of a model, take a sequential one, and create this linear model, a linear function. The first parameter in dense is the number of outputs that I want to get. I can get one, can get uh, whatever, 10, for example. The activation of max. At the output of the sums, I can apply some function soft max, like using the max number or maximization of the result. And then when we are talking about images, we are talking about pixels, and an image is just a matrix of numbers. So for example, we have an input, an image for, with four pixels, and then the neural network is just like this. We have the weights, where it is a matrix. These weights are parameters in, represented, represented in your numbers. We get the input. We can see that image with the results, well, and so on. We just put like a vector in the input. We have the bias. This adjust that you use in your network to approximation. And then we have the output that the scores. And then the scores are associated with a classification, for example, the first number associates to a plane, the second number associates the image to a car. But what I want you to think about it, that neural network is just multiplication, is just sum. The concept behind the numbers that are the human knowledge about the numbers. So when you call about training a neural network, we are calling about this number represents a plane. This number represents a dog, this number represents a cat, and so on. But the math behind it, it's very simple. And then when calling about a neural network, we put more functions with more inputs. For example, the first line, we have more dense layer with more numbers. And then our model becomes more deep a function of function. The linear model, we have the, a simple function applying softmax over the multiplication of x that x you think, can think about my input, and then the weights. And then the neural network, we get other function it use has input of one. Então, so the neural network is just a function of function of function of function and so on. In each function, we can use some different weights. And this function also is very simple. It's just, I will be very repetitive about it because we have a plot twist at the end, just about multiplication. 
and sums. And then my deep neural networks is just the sequence of hiding layers or hiding functions. Uh, so I put a lot of functions one step another and create this from the input layer. We can do a lot of layers. I can talk about it. Hundred of layers, thousands of layers, million of layers, and get the output. And each neuron, remembering, we have a set of inputs, the weights, multiply each input by a weight, sum everything, and feed to activation function for some adjust to my result. And then now comes the plot twist. Each neuron is very simple. It's a dot product. When we have a, a M in a layer, each neuron, which input, get this dot product. We have the result. And then we get all my inputs. We construct a very big matrix, create this representation of a system over here. We have this A matrix. A matrix are all my weights of my neural network. The X is my input and B is my output. And then we have this dense operation. Because we have a matrix with size M and K. And then inside of our computer, we have a, very, uh, a lot of operations. When you do this matrix multiplication, we have about m dot k plus two dot k elements to move inside the R memory, the R memory, the run of the our computer memory, the main memory, and m dot k match operations. For our computers nowadays, our personal computers, smartphones, notebooks, and so on, this is a lot, a lot of computation. It's very simple computation, uh, as I can say that from the beginning. But when we're talking about deep learning, deep neural network, we are talking about millions of millions of millions. Our matrix get a size of 24 gigabytes of memory. And this is a lot of computation. So we have this plot twist. It's very simple computation, but it's very intensive computation. And then our common computers can do this in a personal time. And then we need to use like a graphic process unit and new hardware to do this computation. And then the cloud becomes very important because we have a, uh, we needed to use a very big machines to do this. And it's very impressive need of the machines over here. For example, we have this new RTX GPUs from NVIDIA that can do a lot of computation, but you needed to do in, uh, to put in a computer two, three, four GPUs to do this. And then you need to get a lot of energy in your house or in your escritory to feed this one. So it's very interesting to think that it's very complex uh, and very simple strategy to do neural networks. And also we need a lot of machines to do it. And then the cloud becomes very important in the use of the neural network. And then we have very strategies like batch matrix multiplication. The person flow language indeed is created to do the better manipulation from this matrix to do the transformation from the vectors. So we have a lot of interesting strategies used by the companies. The Google use this proposed hardware TPU and the TensorFlow language to do the better manipulation of this simple math. And we are evolving 
to a model complex de um, great explosion because for example the Microsoft has net get about 6 million parameters so my neural network has 6 million parameters nowadays we are talking about billion of parameters and though this model complexity is a very very big thing the generative adversarial network that I explained use a lot of computation, a lot of parameters. You need to get a big hardware to do this. So uh, the cloud is the solution for this. And for an illustration, a very interesting illustration for you to see uh, after my presentation, the TensorFlow Playground is a very interesting tutorial given by Google that you can play with the concept of neural network. You will define some type of data, that the features, the input, the hidden layers, and so on. Without to do a single line of code, you can apply some knowledge of your neural network. You can uh, configure the linear rate, the activation function, the regularization, and so on the problem type that you use in your neural network. And this uh, works in the cloud. It's a very interesting framework. The playground is mainly for learning, but you can also use it to explore some applications of the neural networks to some problem that you are researching or working with it. So with this, I get to the end of my talk hope that I get you thinking about it because the my objective here is to get you guys to think about what I uh, presented here about the very interesting applications of the neural networks we are getting a very interesting new world nowadays and there is a very strong need to programmers to know about it to work with it and now to know the limitations of the use of the neural network. Neural network are mainly simple math applied in an intensive way that will achieve some very interesting results. And behind the neural networks, we have this mainly fiction thinking about how the AI can <laughs> conquer the world. The think is more simple. You need to know more about math to use AI. Uh, better way. So thank you very much.